I will deal with the first uh, question of meaning of freedom as I see it. Freedom. You know freedom? Much used word. Freedom. Democracy. All these things are very much used. So how did Marx decide, uh, define freedom? Marx defined freedom and uh, freedom is the consciousness of necessity. Uh, that uh, phrase we always use. Marxists always use this phrase of freedom as consciousness of necessity. What does it mean? What does, what's necessity? What exactly is necessity? I myself don't know what he was trying to mean. But uh, as I understood it, uh, what Marx was trying to say is that uh, if you know the laws, what he mean by necessity, I am taking this to mean what I understood of it. If you know the laws that govern phenomenon, uh, any phenomenon, then you can act on it successfully. If you don't know the laws that govern phenomenon, then you, it's not possible to act on it. So, by knowing the necessity means the laws that govern a phenomenon, society, anything, any incident, any involvement, then you are free to be able to effectively act on it. That is what I think he meant, which is correct. That's the in the broader framework. So I'm not going and delving into that aspect of freedom. I am trying to take freedom as from a day-to-day -day living context. So generally, people talk about freedom, uh, country-wise, freedom, democracy, such things. But uh, I'm uh, starting with the very individual themselves. Are we free individuals? It's just a burden, not a freedom. Yeah. So the question of uh, freedom I'm taking from the question of the individual, uh, starting point. Then it comes to the uh, association, then it comes to wider group or party organization, then it comes to society, then the country, uh, like that. But the starting point of freedom is and should be the individual. Now, are we free? Now, what Marx also used the term naturalness. A person, if he is natural, will be sort of free. You know, you act, you don't have to put on pretenses, you don't pretend, uh, try to play games, you don't try and do that. You act naturally, like a tree or like a nature itself. Uh, you are then a sort of free. He used that word, it's there in my book also. Uh, which I refer, his quote, is a very good quote, uh, I don't have it here with me, but Marx talked about naturalness. Now, I'm coming to the exact context of today. You see, most of us live in an alienated world. Alienation, not just from what Marx wrote on the productive, productive process, Marx was existed before Freud. We are alienated because our mind is made up of what the environment creates. Our mind is only a reflection of the environment. It impacts on the mind. We come to the subconscious fact afterwards. And therefore it's imprinted on the mind and creates certain desires, values, emotions, all that type of thing. That is created from our environment, the society, the people we are in touch with. But we ourselves internally, maybe because we are Marxists, maybe because we have other things, whatever it is, every individual has certain emotions and uh, values and things like that determined by their own past, which often comes into conflict with the uh, atmosphere of the environment. So what happens is that a person, unless he's able to understand uh, this uh, contradiction, lives in a atmosphere of knots. He ties himself up into a large number of knots. Who am I? What am I? What I should behave? How I should behave? We are not free to do that. We try and do it as what, to get acceptability. If I'm talking to a Maoist, I will talk like a Maoist. If I'm talking to another person, I will talk like that. If I'm talking to someone else, I'll talk like that. So I am trying to put on pretenses, but I'm not myself. So I'm not really free. 
if I was free, I would talk naturally to anyone and expect that a person, of course I'll talk not in a, a way to offend anyone, but in a way that uh, expresses what I am and I'm thinking. And if we, are, if we don't have that element of naturalness and freedom, it's, it's the starting point of warped relations with our comrades, with our family, with our, anyone we are associated with. We don't have direct uh, a free relationship with people we are associated with, starting right from the family to the comrades to the organization to anyone. We are always living in an unnatural world. And so what happens is that that saps our creativity. If we are natural beings, we are free to think. If we are not uh, natural, we have uh, so much com uh, complexity in our mind that our mind is all wrapped up, you know, like a tied up in a ball like that, that type of stiff and we are not, it's not able to come freely and think creatively. To a large extent, Indian uh, society and especially our caste-based and feudal society, Brahminical uh, values and all that are created from childhood amongst us, comes in conflict with our desires and Western, now it's Western culture which is a, 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 exposed through TV to tell this thing, to that, that, that creates certain values, creates certain sentiments, but we are inbuilt with feudal type of thinking and that type of store. So that con continuous con in India it's terrible, the conflict. In Western societies is not so much because the outer world and inner world is similar. But in a, India which is uh, not gone through any industrial revolution, not gone through uh, uh, this thing, uh, uh, a liberating aspect like the French Revolution or the Industrial Revolution in the West. We have not gone through that. I am not getting into the debate with the Indian society, semi or that, that thing. It's a fact that at the cultural level, we have not gone through any industrial revolution that reflects in our psychology, in the atmosphere, in the our culture, in our values, in our relationships, which is more comes from the feudal context. And that is also increased today in the Hindu atmosphere. Every aspect of this is magnified. Uh, and we are, it's done at the subconscious level. So you see the question of freedom. So now, uh, one more aspect linked to this is that our subconscious mind. Basically our subconscious mind is planned and programmed in the first seven years of our life, according to psychologists. It is in the first seven years of our life that our mind <coughs> develops bas the basic whatever quality, taste, uh, emotions, values, all those type of stuff that's in inbuilt within those seven, eight years before we a, a human being can develop rational thinking. According to psychologists, rational thinking comes after the seventh year, in generally, amongst uh, children, say. And uh, so our subconscious is programmed. Now I turn to, Mar at a later age, I turn to Marxism, I get Marxist ideology. It has certain value system which is opposed to the bourgeois value system. But my subconscious is something different. But the consciousness of my conscious mind, coming from uh, what Marxism says something different. And the environment says something different. It is all somewhat westernized, some top mixed of feudal and westernized atmospheres bombarded daily onto us. Feudal means in our family, in our culture, more feudal type of relation, puja part and this and that and all that type of stuff. While western culture is also imposed uh, by films, TVs, this, that, media, all that type of stuff. So our mind becomes a, what do you call it, a bee's on its nest like a bee. <laughs> we ready to bite anyone. We're full of three things. One is our inbuilt subconscious. One is our in India thing. In the West is different, but uh, in India it is. The second is that it is impacted by the question of uh, uh, the uh, subconscious first. Then uh, our Marxist ideology, which says something else. I'm talking about Marxist. And uh, finally, the environment, which is a hodgepodge of everything uh, in India. This, uh, I'm talking at the cultural level. I'm not again going to economics or the mode of production. I'm going at the cultural level. Uh, it is definitely a hot much of everything. So these three things are impacting on our mind. And then what, if you are not conscious of it, this is the subconscious is there. It's, they say, according to psychologists, 90% or 95% of our mind is subconscious. 
only 5% is the conscious, 5 to 10% is the conscious mind. So it's so impactful. But his conscious mind is the leading part. Like proletariat and the rest of society, it is the conscious which is a small, maybe small, but it is leading. You can use your conscious mind to change your subconscious if you are aware of it. But if you are not aware of it, you will continue in a complete confused state of existence with all these three aspects, as a Marxist three aspects, impacting us. Marxist says you should behave like this, but our subconscious says something else, and our environment is something else, and uh, that is there. So how should I behave? How should I act? We are totally confused that we act in a way basically that serves our interests, finally. And even if it's a Marxist or uh, particularly leadership in communist parties and movement, the, it is geared to s serve that individual's interest, basically maintaining leadership. And that is why you find so many elements of autocracy, lack of democracy, all that type of stuff uh, within these organizations because we are not able to come out of the conditioning that is there within us. Conditioning of our subconscious, conditioning of our uh, environment. Uh, and what we seek to achieve through Marxism is only seeking to achieve. We are not able to do it because we don't have a... and the party does not help. We have formulas like criticism, self-criticism and what do you call it, some things like that uh, within the party. But the, I, in my 50 years of experience, it's more formal. It is not really... Uh, what do you call Nam Matra? That's a nominal, it's superficial. It really doesn't impact. Because I found in our criticism, self-criticism session, if I do something wrong, which is wrong in the marks in our circles, and no one knows about it, I will not self-criticize. If, if it's exposed, then I will say, ha, ah, I did this wrong. And then I say, ha, ah, this is criticism. And it works like that. That's not honest, really. We should be honest to ourselves first. We may not be confident enough to tell it to our comrades, but at least con be con honest to oneself. But there also we are dishonest. And things like a leader dominating, I see this even in small circles, a leader, a leading person is there, he will keep only chamchas around him, he will uh, want flatterers, he will not want people who di uh, disagree with him. And if there is disagreement, he will find ways to isolate and you know, this thing, not debate dialogue and things like that. That is, I've seen very common in Marxist. I'm not talking about society outside. That is taken for granted it's like that. But we should be different, no? But uh, unfortunately we have the same culture that society outside has. So the whole question is that basically the the values so so it starts off from the question of what is Uh, reflecting in, starting from the individual, reflecting in our immediate environment, relationships, that is, starts from family, say, and then uh, organization, party organization, and then in society. So if I've got autocratic tendencies, unless I am conscious of it and want to change it, it will not change of its own in the environment. So from this we come to the question of democracy, the very closely interlinked, freedom and democracy. Uh, the question of democracy, if I am only a free person and I am a free individual, I can create an atmosphere of freedom around, which is a democratic atmosphere. If, if I myself am uh, a warped pers personality, what is it? Marx uses a very good term, some monstrosity. Uh, he uses a very good terminology for this. In this context only, he presents it in another way, it's there in my article also. But uh, the question is, we become a warped monstrosity, like, I mean, we are just like a monster, a monster is there, you know, in that way we are, uh, exist. And so what happens is that if we are unfree, how can we create freedom in our atmosphere? It's not possible. Because in my interactions, I will be making pretenses, I will be autocratic, I'll be this, I'll be that. Because my whole mind is full of complexities. How can I be, uh, expect uh, the other person? And how can I help 
the other, if I'm a leader, say, if the person's a leader and he's filled with all these complexities, he might be a good ideologue, he might be a good mass leader, he might be organized, so he becomes a leader in a party or in an organization. But is he really free and also to bring out the individuality of anyone, everyone else? Everyone has an individuality, not individualism, I'm talking about individuality, everyone has an element of their own individuality, positive, negative. So what is the task of any leading person, especially in an organization like the Marxist who wants to change society, change the individual, is to bring out the positive in the person of his individuality, his or her individuality, and bring about that change in this thing. Now if I, as a leading person, I myself feel with thousands of complexes and complexities, how I can interact and bring out those qualities in another person, I cannot. So it is all formal. It is all organization. It is all uh, uh, you see in a party organizations. You see following the line, this line, that line, those that line, all those lines. Business is there. That's all. But the purpose of uh, this thing is to really bring out the individuality in individuals, so that they can flower and blossom. That is what, in fact, Marx did talk about in his earlier writings. And of course, Mao talked about it uh, much in the Cultural Revolution and before that. But the whole question is that we have to see how we can bring out the individuality in people. And we talk about democratic centralism and democracy, which I've written in my book also. It's a, there was a big debate in the 20s, 1920s, 30s on democratic centralism, autocratic, Trotsky, uh, Rosa Luxemburg, all these people opposed it. They talked about it is not, it's an autocratic structure because what happens is in real life they somehow become autocratic, the leader becomes dominating and it is. But I, uh, my point is that nothing could be more democratic than the concept of democratic center because the major, minority subordinate to the majority was more democratic than that. But in real terms it becomes autocratic. So what Trotsky and uh, Rosa Luxemburg and all the others might say, structural differences and changes and all that to bring about, it's not possible. You have any structure, democratic central structure or any other structure they talk about, if the individual is, the leader is autocratic, it will continue to be autocratic. There's no question. The question is starting from the change in values and cultures that, that I've talked about in my book also is that we have to change the values and culture in uh, on the basis of freedom, happiness and a new value system of modesty, simplicity and all those things. Unless we do that and unless the leadership is conscious that this is a necessity for myself and with it other people, it will not change. You will not get democracy, you will not get freedom, you will not get it. Whatever structure you have, democratic syndrome or you have uh, other loose organization or you have anything, uh, there will be that autocratic functioning. So the whole question is, again coming back, the individual has to change. If the individual doesn't change, the other, co if it's a leader, the other community should help him to change. If he has other positive qualities in the sphere of organization and ideology and all that stuff, okay, it should be helped to change. If it shouldn't change, it should be replaced. That culture should be there inside the organization. But here what happens? If it's there, autocratic, we split, form another group. The other group is also as autocratic and the third one is also as autocratic and that thing keeps multiplying. We don't get into the essence of the problem that we should cooperatively try and correct that if, if the leader is not effective and he is not a co competent even in other spheres, then a person naturally should be replaced by someone who is more competent. But if he is competent, which normally they are, who come to leadership, they are competent in the sphere of organization or in the sphere of ideology or something. But in the sphere of values and the sphere of outlook, they may not be so. And generally they are not. They have to say the particularly autocratic values and all those type of things. So he should, first the person he or she should be helped to change by the other cadres in the organization or the or structure that exists uh, to realize his role so that he doesn't. If not, then the person should be changed. And because what is important is the culture of democracy and value system, not the individual. How are we to achieve the cu culture of democracy and value system in an organization, in anybody, in a family, I'm saying, starting from family only. In an ordinary society, you might not be even a Marxist or doing any active work. 
Even in ordinary society, the same thing applies. So the whole question is that we have to try and build this culture. And that is why I am saying that the importance is to change internally. And the change internally is not easy. Because we are, a subconscious is, is programmed in a different way because of childhood experiences and childhood environment. It is further programmed by a semi-feudal type of environment, feudal, western, all that type of culture that we see around us. It is further impacted. And we ourselves have our Marxist uh, thinking and we should uh, be what we are supposed to be and things like that, what Marxism says. And we have our own, our fourth complexity, we have our own desires and feelings and emotions also, which are there at the surface. So all these things impacting on one person's mind, you can imagine what a monster it becomes. Unless we are able to clear the knots clearly one by one, cut them and become a free individual and we become a free, uh, remove all the knots that are and complexities that are dominating our mind and become a free person, only then we will become creative. Actually, the, I, I feel that, find that, except in maybe in the 40s and 50s, Marxist writings have been totally, uh, in India, have been very uh, poor in uh, creativity. At those periods you had some good pe uh, writers and all, more at the intellectual level, uh, creative writing. Where is the creative writing in the last 30, 40 years? You'll hardly find it in the Marxist circle. And uh, because of it's partly because of all this. Uh, people are afraid also, people are this thing, you're part of an organization, you're afraid to free th think freely because you'll be branded, you'll be this thing, ostracized, you'll be this, you'll be that, all that type of things will happen. And uh, if you're bold enough to stand by your views, then you, you have to be self-confident. No, if you are full of complexities, you cannot be self-confident to take face that. If you have uh, removed that, then you can make self on the face and yes, I know what I'm saying is correct and I'll try and live by it. What I'm saying is, I'll not try and uh, live a, a pretense type of life and of, of a fake uh, existence, which 90% people do in this society, are forced to do. I'm not blaming individuals. The environment creates that and we are victims of that environment. So this is one important aspect, I feel, I feel a very key aspect of freedom and democracy. It's not that it wasn't right to be uh, deal, dealt with earlier. It was right to be dealt with to some extent. But I think uh, given our past history and Russian Revolution, Chinese Revolution and the Marxist uh, thoughts that have been there, we have to try and incorporate this into our ex life, organization, right from the start itself. Only then we can create a, start creating a better world and also because you, you, you what I used to think is we have a circle of 10 people, a committee say, has formed, party committee is there, 10 people. In that there is one autocrat and that autocrat will do all his cunningness and manipulations and all to maintain that leadership. Imagine if he came to power, what would you do? <laughs> if we run the country, I mean this is just hard, 5-10 people we act like that. I mean if he came to power, what would we become a real monster? So, uh, that's the importance is to try and build right from now in a new way. Uh, new way, I'm saying by Indian side, it's not that uh, China didn't build in this way and all that, they did. They tried their best, of course it uh, failed finally. But we have to see the reason for that. But we have to take, at India also, this is even more fundamental to start from beginning because we have inbuilt, which no other society has, caste superiority, superiority, first hierarchical superiority, let's say. You can see by the body language itself, a person's caste, because the self-confidence of an upper caste because of the environment, not his fault, I'm not saying it's his fault or her fault. It's the fault of the society that has built this practical uh, culture and all that is filled. That way a person uh, is more effective who comes from the upper caste because they are more equipped and all that type of stuff. They have uh, more self-confidence. They can dominate also more better. They can book uh, sophisticatedly dominate. A person from a low caste might do it crudely and they won't be able to be effective. But the sophisticated, grammatical consciousness, you can dominate without knowing yet. 
person will not know you are being dominated. So it can be done so. So in India, it is absolutely fundamental because these things play out at the subconscious level. This Brahminical thinking and all that, it may not be in the form of crude caste or crude patriarchy, but it can be in the form of subtle game playing, subtle associations. And it is, I've seen it in my own uh, lengthy life. I'm not saying everything is negative, I'm, I'm saying this also is there. But, I, and what I'm trying to present is, is that basically this has to be removed only to better what we are doing. What we are doing to do it in a better way, a more long-lasting effect, even after we come to power, to have these uh, incorporate all this. Maybe more things uh, we should share and see what can be done. Maybe more things. So that's why I've uh, given this question of freedom, such an important freedom, new values, and happiness. See, the thing is, new values. We talk about, that is one thing we all talk about, bourgeois values, proletarian values, we put it in those terms. But, uh, but it doesn't play out actually in real life. I have seen that a person is never demoted in a party organization for being egotistic or for being dominating or for being uh, autocratic. He is demoted for flimsy things, uh, some sort of other things, uh, some mistakes or some whatever else it is, that's all. But not for the serious errors or something like that, no one has ever considered. Why? Because it's not given importance. So the whole question is that in today's atmosphere, we really need to give the serious thought in a practical daily existence and life, starting from ourselves. And I think if we do that and we create such an atmosphere, we ourselves will be happier and our comrades and peoples around us will be happier in their association, not at ill at ease. Otherwise everyone is ill at ease, starting from the individual leader, because the party leader has to be always seen to be a leader. So he, even if he has flaws, he must cover it up. So the thing is that covering up something is not something that gives us ease of mind. Ease of mind means we should be a natural being. Well, I have given in my book, Anuradha, that's my late wife, as a model. And not because she was the wife or anything, because she was like that, a natural being. And whoever people have seen her and would know also. She was like a, just a natural being, she, everything, her emotions would show on her face within minutes. Whether it's anger, whether it's happiness, whether it's this thing, he could not make any pretenses about it. And no element of ego also, though she was top leader and things like that. I didn't see any of all that. There will be others also. I knew her from, from close quarters, so I could say I knew her weaknesses also. So, but I could see that, so I give it as a model. But uh, only to, because it's a living example. For me, it was a, for uh, people who know her also, it's a living example. You would say the same thing people, of course, many people don't accept that who have these values in our organization or past organization. But, uh, so that is the thing. So the question is that, that's the concept that I say in a living sense. I'm not going by the Marxist concept of freedom as consciousness and necessity. That's there at the general level. But I'm saying in our daily life, how it plays out and how we need to incorporate in starting from ourselves, our family, our organization, and then the world around us in our relationships. And why I'm saying, again, coming to the second part of the topic, the Bhakti movement, of course you'll tell me more about it, I don't know that much. But the second point is that this becomes fundamental in Indian society precisely because of the Brahminical consciousness that is so prevalent. The Brahminical consciousness is not just in Brahmins, it pervades every section of society in various forms. In the level of consciousness, in the level of dealings and the question of <coughs> even in the level of I'm telling you body language. Even at the level of body language and things like that, it is it plays out. So we have such a rich coming to the second part just briefly. It's nearly over now. Yeah. yeah. So the point is that uh, this we have if you look at our bhakti tradition or the non brahmination go beyond bhakti also. Starting right from the Charvakas, Buddhism, I mean uh, the seventh century BC. 7th century BC till now, continuous struggle has been there in whatever way, ending with uh, the present day uh, Periya, Jyotiba Phule and Ambedkar. 
uh, and I'd add Anand Tumde now to Ambedkar's thinking. It's certainly a development of Ambedkar's or uh, Anand's works. But uh, so we have this tradition in India stretching right from 7th century BC till today. It's a struggle against the Brahminical domination at whatever level. Some people say it was Hinduized again or something, or whatever it is, it will have the limitations of its time. That also we must see, whether it's the Bhakti or whether all these things. It's certainly more than what exists today. If we look at the question of time, there's no element of Bhakti around just now. So, yeah, in Tamil Nadu you might have it, but it rests away in the country is totally non, especially with the Modi, this Hindutva wave. Not just Modi, it started from 84, 85 with neoliberalism. So, the whole thing is that we have this very strong democratic tradition. And this very strong democratic tradition has to be taken forward, incorporated into our every aspect of our activities, even our outlook, in our thinking, right from there, and reflected in our relationship, reflected in a in a movement also, a non-Brahman movement. That's at a later stage. So all these things have to be incorporated. So for that. We really need to study our bhakti traditions. They vary a lot. In Tamil Nadu, in South India, they have something. In Maharashtra, we have some other thing. In Bengal, I was surprised when I went there. I didn't even know it existed. It has a very strong bhakti tradition out there. They said the whole part of central Bengal, BJP can never make headway out there, only because the bhakti tradition is very strong in about five, six districts. So, we have that, it's there amongst the people, it's not there with us in the Marxist circle. That is the problem. So we have to somehow evolve uh, it into our Marxist uh, uh, program and action uh, as we go into the future now. Uh, we must take lessons from the past and go into the future in a more creative way, taking forward our democratic Bhakti uh, uh, non-Brahman traditions. We have to. It's a basically a, a democratic tradition, with all its limitations of time and space. But it is a democratic tradition on which we are talking about democratic revolution. So this, if we don't take these traditions forward, how can we really make the democratic revolution? And I, in my book, I've only mentioned this, but in course of discussions, and all, I've come more become more clarity. There, in the book, I only say that unless you annihilate caste, caste is it's by itself divisive, undemocratic and uh, hierarchical and oppressive. So without annihilation of caste, you cannot bring democracy to India. I've just said that, but it, we have to go beyond that. You know. That is my understanding when I wrote the book, Fractured Freedom. And now it's more developed through interaction, in fact, that it is a deep bhakti tradition, uh, the non Brahman tradition, which we have to incorporate into uh, ideology, into the movement, and make Marxism a living thing in the Indian context, not a dead formula and formalistic thing, Russian line, Chinese line, these type of lines. Although we have to make it a living thing which comes, which touches the heart of the Indian people, and that is the non Brahman tradition. And if we don't do it, given the Hindutva thing and the neoliberal policy, everything will be Hinduized, uh, Brahmanized. It's already there. In Maharashtra, the Bhakti tradition, the Varkari movement, is totally Brahmanized. There's no element of uh, uh, the reform contained within it, that uh, Pandrapur Yatra and all those things. So we see that living thing, and well, that's, I'll just touch on that. That's what we could translate. Thanks. Thank you. I think I've tried to cover it with that.